Welcome to today's webinar, Decoding GMP Equalization, What Happens Next, which we are very pleased to be holding today along with our education partner, Equinity. While GMP equalization has been hanging over our collective head for around 30 years, the Lloyd's decision in 2018 has given it momentum. We know now that schemes must actively engage with the equalization process and proactively prepare for the future. The eternal question that pension funds have about GMP is, where on earth do you start? Well, the good news is that you're here with us today and the presentation you're about to see really goes in depth to explain what your various options are and how to decide which path your scheme is going to take with regard to GMP equalization. My name is Rachel Pine and I look after content for the PLSA's conference and training offerings. With us today is Stuart Winter, lead project consultant at Equinity, who eats, sleeps and breathes GMP equalization just who we need to guide us through this extremely important topic. Equinity are one of the leading providers of pension administration in the UK, and they specialize in delivering highly complex projects in areas including benefit audits, data analysis, de-risking, and of course, equalization. And we also have a GMP equalization made simple guide that's brand new and being published this week. Before Stuart begins, we've got a couple of polling questions, three of them actually, to start us off. So, the first question is, how would you rate your understanding of GMP equalization? None, basic, intermediate, or advanced? Probably best that I don't answer that as uh, <laughs> basic then. It looks as if most people, the vast majority are basic or intermediate. So very good there. Um, a couple of people have no information and a couple even have advanced, so very good. Hopefully they'll share with us. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing that. And then there's another question. Have you or are you planning on instigating a GMP equalization project within the next 12 months? So it looks as if most people have started, a third of them nearly have already started. And we've still got some in the undecided category. Then there's one more question which is, do you feel you have the right support and, to, and direction to do your equalization? So yes, no, or you're not sure. All right, I think everyone's voted who will be. Thank you all for voting. So you can see that more than half feel they have the right support. So I think as a group, you can see that people have a you know, basic and advanced knowledge. Um, Definitely interest, they've already started or looking to start and about half feel they have the right support. So really good to know where everybody is on this. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing the results and the poll and um, turn this over to you, Stuart. So thank you very much. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I hope everybody's well in the, the current situation. Um, Obviously, my beard's getting longer. The photo is not where I am now, obviously. Um, but yeah, my name's Stuart Winter. I work for Equinity. Um, I work for a specialist part of Equinity under data solutions, where we look at sort of complex issues, complex problems, and try to resolve them as simply as possible. Um, I'm one of the operations directors for that group. Um, and feel free to ask as many questions um, as you wish. We had a, a really funky slide uh, that we were going to show. Um, the only problem is that the technology has just not allowed us to do this. Um, yeah, so we had this slide. We, we actually had this um, aligned to sort of Star Wars theme. So when we send the slides out, uh, or when PLSA send the slides out to everybody, this will look a little bit different. Um, but yeah, in 1990, there was a landmark case uh, between Barber and Garden Royal Exchange, or GRE, um, and that went to the, the European Court of Justice. You know, prior to this judgment, it was normal practice for you know, UK pension schemes to um, have a different retirement age, and, and most commonly, or typically, 65 for men, 60 for women. Um, and obviously, the state pension you know, reflected this. Um, the case was brought by Mr. Barber, and in fact, that's somebody I need to see very quickly. Um, under the UK Sex Discrimination Act, um, and he felt he was differently treated um, by the scheme uh, as a, you know, 
to that of a woman of the same age, etc. You know, a comparator to, to himself. Um, though the settlement of the case failed, um, uh, you know, originally it did come to legislation in, in May 1997 from May, the famous Barber Day, and obviously clarified in 1994. And that said that all UK pension schemes were required to pay equal benefits to comparable men and women in relation to their service. You know, most schemes equalised their benefits based on scheme service, um, but few addressed inequalities arising from, you know, the GMP calculation based on sex. Now, we know that some schemes have, um, you know, performed GMP equalisation, be it because they fell into the PPF or through buyout, but in the main, most schemes did not or have not. Um, but obviously from that original 1990 judgment, it was not clear on how the unequal GMP should be treated. So what's changed? So obviously um, what has changed is uh, the Lloyd's uh, case of 2018, October 2018. But before we, we touch upon that, I'm probably getting ahead of myself here. Um, the story so far, so you know, the brief, run through of you know what or where this has come about from so we know that there's a basic state pension and everyone paying full rate ni contributions would build up the basic state pension on top of this there was a state earnings related pension scheme or affectionately known as SERPs. Uh, many employees you know either voluntary or through their schemes actually contracted out of SERPs, and the benefit was that they would pay a reduced national insurance contributions in exchange for a higher benefit from that of their private pension scheme. Um, this was limited to defined benefit schemes up until 1988, um, and then from there it was extended to defined contribution schemes. In 2002, SERPs was renamed State Second Pension, and in April 2016, contracts now was abolished um, and in favour of a single state pension. So up to that SERPs, uh, the GMP was created. So this was the minimum amount of pension paid by UK occupational schemes to employees that contracted out of SERPs between 1978, 6th of April 1978, through to 5th of April 1997. So, as we said, GMPs run between 78 and 97. Notionally, the GMP would, should be equivalent to the amount the individual um, had given up you know, had they remained uh, in SERPs. And there's two sets of rules that are linked to GMP um, on the annual inflation, and that is the rules of pre-88, or 1978 to 1988, and post-88, being 88 to 97. Um, schemes had no obligation to, to provide inflation-linked increases or, or increases in payment for the pre-88, whereby, or, or or what differs in the post-88 is that increases should be applied uh, and they were capped to 3%. Um, based on RPI uh, up until 2010 and then more recently CPI. Uh, the accrual rates are different for these two periods. So they actually um, are calculated differently and they grow differently through accrual. So if a scheme was contracted out, some or all of a member's pensions accrued between the 78 and 97 will be made up of GMP. So what changed? You know, getting back to this question. Well, we had the, the landmark uh, Lloyds Banking Group, um, Trustees Limited, taking the high call to call. So Lloyds, alongside their sponsors, the bank, a union, um, looked to see clarity on two points. There was a third, but the third point was, was immaterial. Um, the two major points were whether the, the, the trustees had a duty to remove the inequalities arising from that of a GMP that has always been unequal. And if they said that they should, by what calculation method should they be adjusting members' benefits? So in October 2018, judgment confirmed you know, that GMP equalisation is a requirement. Um, and then they also provided a number of approaches for to be exact with subcategories within those four, which we'll look at in a little bit. Trustees were obliged to make back payments, or are obliged, I should say, to make back payments to all members that are affected by equalisation. And this potentially could go back 
as early as 1990, i.e. the Barber date, 17th of May 1990, the, uh, the date that these rules should be adhered to. Um, but again, this is dependent upon scheme rules, you know, forfeiture, etc., etc. And um, if in doubt, um, it's probably worth speaking to your, your scheme lawyers. Um, on top of that, uh, of the back payments, uh, the case said that simple interest um, should be applied and that should be 1% above base rate. So here we have a, a bit of a timeline since 2018, October 2018, uh, being a lawyer's judgment and a few of the things that have happened between then and now. Now we've had a follow up hearing um, early 2019. Uh, we've had a, a number of groups that have opened up, um, PASA being one, uh, DWP you know, giving guidance, uh, HMRC also giving guidance. Um, all the way through to uh, the court case that happened uh, last month, we're still, I believe we're waiting for verdict um, on the treatment of past GMPs or past transferring of GMPs. So who is affected now? What creates a GMP inequality? You know, um, GMP, uh, GMP inequality um, has come about because of the trying to replicate that of the state benefits um, and the differing rules between that of the state and that of the scheme. You know, the age of receiving GMP has always been um, 60 for females, 65 for males. Obviously, it's changing now um, with the onset or the transition of state pension ages. But in the main, for certainly for private sector schemes, the two ages are 60 for females, 65 for males. And the GMP that was accrued during this period was shorter for that of a female. Because the female had a shorter time to actually accrue benefits, uh, the accrual rate for female was um that bit faster um, and that's because uh, a female's call would uh, cease at the 5th of april before 60 and for a man 5th of april before 65 you know they call that um the final relevant year or fry so the call rate is normally higher for that of a female as we've already said um, and this is to compensate for the shorter call period uh, and gmp will normally have a different increase increase rate to non-gmp um, in the main, we know that pre-88 GMP uh, statutorily will revalue or, or sorry, will increase at zero, um, whereby the post-88 again, 3% or RPI, or to a maximum 3%. Um, also, whilst in um, deferment periods, so when a member leaves a scheme before they reach their retirement or GMP age, um, the revaluation linked to GMP is, you know, different to that of a scheme, you know, and most commonly uh, fixed rate was applied um, and fixed rate, depending on when a member left, um, has spanned from eight and a half percent per year um, down to four percent. We also have the, the anti-franking provisions that apply at 60 for a female, 65 for a, for a male, um, and this one area does affect how we equalize GMPs. Um, especially for a female, let's say the female leaves in 60, you know, age 62, uh, a male member at the same age, 62, would have accrued GMP post age 60. And obviously we need to establish um, what is the correct GMPs for both the true sex and that of the opposite sex. So who is affected? So of the actual members within the schemes, um, and this is UK in the main DB pension schemes, defined benefit pension schemes, it's those members that built up GMP between 17th of May 1990 and 5th of April 1997. So those um, members um, will also include those that have transferred in benefits as well. Um, again, just mentioned the court case that happened last uh, week, and that court case was to determine who was liable for the test and resolution of the GMP that was transferred into a scheme. Is it the receiving scheme or the seeding scheme? Uh, now, there's a lot of debate. Um, I think the court case itself has gone 
a way that probably has um, is not as pragmatic as we first thought. Obviously, understanding that uh, the previous scheme or the seeding scheme should have uh, transferred full benefits. Obviously, at the time it didn't because it hadn't equalised GMPs. But yet again, we're still waiting for that court final verdict. And it may be that we treat different members differently, um, be it if a scheme was taken over or by member uh, you know, asking for the transfer in their own regards. And obviously we've got some DC schemes that operate or have operated in the past and underpin. Um, and again, this is like the, the DB schemes, the underpin is in relation to accrued uh, right between the 17th of May 1990 and that of 5th of April 1997. So, now moving on. So what are this, all the options or the methods that were recommended by the court? Now they said straight away that past payments um, should be looked at. And this should be looked at on a year-by-year -year approach, the better of test. And that that correction payment should be paid to the disadvantaged member based on um, the criteria of that of the opposite sex and then interest should be applied to this payment again we mentioned that a bit before that's bank base rate plus one percent at least one percent uh, future payments um, there is two methods there's the comparative and there's the conversion so the comparative methods by looking year on year um, are methods a through to c and the one-off approach the conversion or method d so the year-by-year -year approach is operating a shadow payroll um, or payrolls, um, tracking the pension the member should have received against that the opposite sex would have received, and giving by one of those various methods uh, the better of test. Uh, the conversion is an actuarial comparison value of member and that of the opposite sex, and if the lower is paid to uh, the lower of the amount should be paid uh, the additional pension and the GMP will be converted into a non-GMP uh, benefit. So looking at the four methods, we have A to D. So method A equalizes each unequal aspect of the benefit separately. Method B provides a better of male or female comparator each year, whereas method C is like method B, but looks at accumulated offset that has happened in the past and then gives the better of test. Um, and method E is just a complete one-off, it's an actual equivalent. It's changing uh, the member's benefits, uh, looking into the future and giving them the better over the, the, the course of lifetime. So looking at the method A, we have the three methods um, that are under method A. Each aspect is equalised separately on equivalent male and female basis each year, with a higher amount paid each year. Now this is, or was even said in the court case, the most expensive method for schemes. Um, it requires dual record keeping, and it also uh, requires employer's consent. The dual record keeping is relatively straightforward in this method. It is simply which is the better year on year on year. Uh, method B, you know, method B is both members' pensions um, are calculated both on the true sex and that of the opposite sex, and each year the higher amount is paid. This, again, requires dual record keeping and employer's consent. Method C is the same as method B, uh, and instead of the higher pension automatically being paid to that of the disadvantaged um, uh, member, the pension is actually examined through the lifetime of payment. So if the comparison switches from one sex to the other, the scheme pays the lower amount until the gains that they've already received have caught up. And then it's switched across to the, to the, the more beneficial sex. So C2 differs slightly and, and as it allows for interest on uh, the offset of the gains. This requires triple record keeping and possibly even quadruple record keeping. Um, requires employer's consent, whereas uh, C2 can be instructed by the employer. Method two, uh, sorry, method D is a one off actuarial calculation of future rights with additional benefits paid to disadvantaged sex. 
D1 paid as additional pension, whereas D2 is uh, converts to GMP to non-GMP rights. You know, schemes or initial feelings were that schemes could use this as ability to sort of radic you know, radicalize their, their, the way they pay members benefit, make it more simple, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, again, this requires employees' consent and may prove to be the cheapest option. The reason that, you know, the thoughts was this was the cheapest is that this is an actual valuation on the benefit. It also requires less um, admin uh, interaction. Um, it doesn't need dual record keeping triple. It is literally a one-off um, task. But regardless of that, you know, if we're looking at back payments, one of the other three methods, A to C, must be adhered to for back payments. And normally, you know, this is the debate of the C2, D2, you know, which is the method uh, scheme should apply. So yeah, decision decisions, you know, it's up to the trustees, the sponsor employers to determine which is the most suitable for them. Now, all schemes are different. Um, all schemes have their, their nuances um, and what is good for one may not actually be good for another. So again, this is where schemes, alongside their sponsor employers needs to determine what is most suitable. Now we would say that um, if schemes got their advisors all together in a room, collaboratively working, that decision could become that bit easier. You know, understanding all of the, the issues that affect equalization and then making an informed decision um, as to which is the most suitable for that scheme. So preparing for GMP equalization. So this is where, or what can be done now? You know, what, what should schemes be focusing uh, on now? We know that we're awaiting um, answers to court cases. We know that there's gonna be further guidance from PASA. We know that there's gonna be further guidance from HMRC. But what can schemes be doing now um, that gets them ahead of the, the playing field? You know, what, 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 what can they do that will not detract um, should any of the guidances or the court cases go either way. Now straight away we know that GMP reconciliation, rectification needs to be completed. Um, most schemes are shown to this, some schemes are even finished. Um, other schemes are looking at rectification and seeing if they can actually um, you know combine this with an equalization rectification um, exercise. You know one one hit, uh, sort of everything out together. Uh, the only consideration that should be taken at that point is how long between rectification on GMP reconciliation and that of equalization. If we're talking months, maybe a year, then actually that might be a suitable route to, to, to do it in one hit. However, if that period of time could be years, um, it may be that schemes feel that GMP reconciliation and rectification is completed you know, fully before starting uh, the equalization calculations. Um, we would always advocate to you know, ensuring that your contract of that data is robust. You know, we, we always have taken the, the base data, um, ensure that we have everything in place that we can replicate calculations. We know that we can and we'll come to it a bit later, we, we need to um, calculate the true sex post-90 GMP and the equivalent of the opposite sex. But having that base data in place means that that job will be easier. It will become more straightforward. You know, assumptions can be made if there's lack, you know, data lacking or if um, HMRC's calculation is wrong. Now we do know that HMRC cannot calculate all post mining GMPs for the true sex and the opposite sex um, for all members of our schemes. You know, one example is um, for spouses that have not um, or are not in receipt of um, state benefits. So another thing that uh, schemes can concentrate on is the common and conditional reporting. You know, focus should be made on improving the reporting scores. You know. The, the reporting scores obviously are determined by the data. You know, the better the score, the better the data. Uh, therefore, we advocate that the focus should be to improve um, 
both of those, you know, both the, the common and conditional reporting. Um, we believe that, you know, data for acting deferred is complete, is accurate, um, and ideally it is at 100%. You know, if we have all of the active data, all of the def def deferred data in place, again, that will make the job of equalisation that bit easier. So again, you know, we, we talked about the true sex calculation, the opposite sex calculation. That again, that's a job that can be done now. Um, and again, off the back of that, we can retranche or reapportion members' benefits based on the true sex's uh, post-90 GMP, so that we've got that in place. We could even retranche and have a pseudo uh, opposite sex benefit sitting there ready and waiting. Um, definitely the first one is appropriate. The second one may be up to you know, people's opinions on how um, schemes are going. But at least having the opposite sex is post-19 GMP calculated and ready for equalisation is, you know, is advantageous. Again, Clayton scheme history, all the way back to 1990, may want to go back a little bit further to 78, but ensuring all factors are known and agreed between all parties. At the end of the day, um, this is a, a major rectification job. This will be signed off by the scheme actuaries. By having the scheme history in place will allow that part of the, the process um, to be agreed that bit quicker. And again, there's a debate of how much data you need or, or, or that is required for schemes, um, and we'll touch upon that in a little bit. So uh, another thing that schemes can do is establishing the scope of the GMP equalisation, you know, which members are potentially affected. And then from there, you know, what is, you know, can we calculate or initially calculate uh, GMP equalisation on a basis, maybe C2, maybe a PPF basis, maybe a forms approach, a formulaic approach, um, to establish those members that will be positively affected by uh, GMP equalisation. And they're the guys that we will be actually topping up benefits. Um, by knowing uh, which members are positively affected, we can concentrate on that group, and that group alone, and the data deficiencies, um, or come up with assumptions on the data. You know, we all know our schemes, some schemes are, um, you know, have better data than others. You know, some data it could be on you know, paper files, fiches, etc. Um, should a, an exercise be taken out to actually get those fiches scanned? Uh, again, that's up to each individual scheme to to look at, you know, where their schemes are and how they want to to go through equalisation. Again, we've said before, you know, creating collaborative working groups between all advisors, you know, having the lawyer and the uh, actuary and the administrator all speaking together, informing what can and cannot be done based on decisions that are being made will help uh, schemes get through this um, that bit quicker. And again, keep abreast of developments, you know, court cases, HMRC guidance, you know, passer guidance, you know, talks like this. Um, the PLSA, you know, as an industry, we should be allowing all of us to actually learn to, to, to get through this um, unscathed. You know, we can only get through it unscathed and together if we are working together. So yeah, you know, every player has their part, you know. The pension scheme is in the middle and at the center of each pension scheme is the member themselves, you know. At the end of the day, this is a member issue members are affected by this um uh, you know but or say that you know members may not understand what's going on you know half the industry are you know come to terms what this means and how this affects uh, certain parts of pension scheme so yes so around the pension scheme we have the advisors and the trustees and the company themselves so the decision makers have always been and always will be the trustees and the company together. So the advisors being that of the lawyer and the actuary um, advising uh, the pension schemes on where is the best way to go. So that's jumped forward for some reason. Um, but if we go back to this slide, you know, the, um, the administrator um, as well as the the actuary are the operation, you know, the calculation, be it the C2 for the back payments, be it um, the 
um, you know, the, for, uh, the forward uh, calculations for that of um, the conversion, you know, and actually putting this into practice, be it, you know, you know, the collaborative, the year on year assessment would be the administrator. So going on, there's two routes. Um, we, we know that um, there's the GMP longer road, there's the GMP shorter road. Now schemes will fill what is best for them. The longer route involves uh, major benefit correction exercises, data audits, trying to assess everyone and get all of the data in place. The shorter road it possibly is a, can be used as a pragmatic, smarter solution. You know grabbing hold of, you know, formulaic or roadback solutions. And again, just uh, as a summary, you know, know your data, know your systems, you know, consider previous project synergies. Do you have um, sort of tolerances for paying benefits on rectification? Do you have a, a de minimis in place? You know, keep abreast of the legal issues. Again, put the pieces together, collaborative working, and then just essentially, a robust plan in place. Very good. Thank you, Stuart. A lot to take in. We covered a lot in just under 31 minutes. So thank you for that. We have a good number of questions. So I am going to ask you some of them. Um, so to start out, um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about, you know, you went over the, the four methods. So so two questions together. What is the risk that any of methods A to D will be shown later to be incorrect, requiring, requiring us to start over again? And when you look at those four side by side, why would any scheme not go for method D? Um, yeah, obviously there's two parts to that question. So the, the first one, I think this is this has always been our industry. You know, our industry has always been born and it's countless examples where the industry has done something, you know, something has not gone as well as expected. You know, the benefit of hindsight comes into play and the review is, you know, it, it, it's, it just, it's born, you know, by um, disgruntled um, members, um, you know, by lawyers getting together people and then bringing a case against. I think this is where the industry needs to stick together. You know, if, if we feel that this is robust, um, we should go with it. We should be listening to the, the lawyers. We should be getting them to, to tell us what is the road, you know, what is the, the, the method that should be applied that doesn't affect or, or is, has least impact on schemes. Um, but yeah, it's one of those questions, you know, it's the crystal ball question, you know, um, what can we do? What should we be doing now? Um, and what's the effects of the future? But saying that though, you know, um, equalization has been you know, done by schemes. You know, certain schemes that went into the PPF did a version of uh, equalization. And we know schemes that go to buy it have done, again, a version of um, equalization. Um, I think this is, you know, a time will tell. Um, but the second part of that question, uh, you'd have to remind me, Rachel, Oh, sure. It was looking when you see them side by side, why would any scheme not choose to use method D? Well, yeah, I think that's personal opinion. You know, the, the, the debate was the C2 or D2, you know, which way would you go? Um, I think on the, on the face of it, D2 does look the most attractive. It, it simplifies members' benefit, it allows benefits to be paid um, that bit more simply through revenue. However, schemes might not be able to, you know, there's the employer's consent, there's members' consent that needs to be applied. It may be that, you know, for certain schemes, it's not actually appropriate. Um, we know that method D is the one that is, at this moment, preferred by equalization companies, uh, insurance companies, especially in buyer. You know, if, if they are not going to run a dual payroll, they will only want method D. Um, it also, and I've probably failed to mention, you know, whilst going through equalization, you can switch. You know, you could start off on a C2, you could actually equalize on a C2 method. And at some point in the future, you could then switch to a D method. Uh, again, you know, that's up to each individual scheme, what they feel is appropriate for them. 
but yeah, I, I possibly agree that D2 does look the most appropriate. Very good. I have two questions together. So you had a fantastic timeline as part of your presentation. So after that timeline, we'll move over to any guidance that we're expecting in the coming months and are, are schemes meant to be targeting completion of GMP equalization by a certain date or a certain time frame, for instance, the end of 2021? Yeah, I think for me, we had a debate um, on a previous session um, and we were looking or, or trying to establish, you know, when will this be finished? When will equalisation finish? You know, we've been doing GMP reconciliation rectification for the past six years since the abolition in 2014. Um, this is going to be tough. You know, you're going to get your earlier adopters, the schemes that are are pushing and there's a few schemes that are really pushing the boundaries and trying to to, to move this on now they may be um, looking at a bigger picture be it buyouts therefore they want and need to actually finish this quicker um, there is no deadline as such for equalization i think at the moment it'd be inappropriate to put one in but there again if one was in it would target people's minds a bit of a you know double-edged sword is that you know having a deadline in place will be good it focuses however it could be um, an absolute nightmare we know that the industry only has a certain number of individuals that understand this can actually help evolve this to push it on um, they will become uh, a very scarce resource um, what was the first part of the question Rachel um, it was what are we expecting are we expecting some further guidance in the coming months yeah, we, we know that um, PLSA, uh, that's yourselves, um, we know PASA um, are bringing out guidance that we know that guidance around data um, is a biggie. Um, and we know that the reason this data hasn't come out is because of um, the varying you know, opinions from advisors. You know, this is an industry-led uh, group of people from all, all different uh, practices. Um, and I think there's that debate, you know, should full data be in place, so a reconstructive uh, first principle approach taken, which uh, I can tell you from doing these exercises, it would be expensive, you know, trying to find data for members that retired, you know, back in the, you know, the early 80s. Um, actually, they wouldn't be effective because only post 90, um, call myself out there. Um, so for members that, you know, retired early 90s, you know, we might not have that data to reconstruct. Yes, we have enough data to pay the members the right pension, or you know, we assume that the right pension is in place, but we don't have enough to reconstruct that benefit from first principles. We also know that uh, you know, the shorter, more pragmatic, um, possibly slightly riskier is to take a, a formulaic approach or, or a rollback. But I think with good sampling, good testing, um, formulaic or sampling could be as good um, as that of um, you know the full reconstruction method, and again schemes need to to look into this and see what's uh, for them. But yeah, again you know pass uh, yeah PASA you know are developing more and more guidance. Um, I think industry leads are, are actually pushing for that, um, and they're the ones writing this stuff. You know they're the ones coming together discussing it and pushing it. Out. We know that HMRC will you know push more on the tax implications. Um, they will obviously put out some more guidance. Um, we hope to, to see more and more from DWP. And then depending on what happens with this court case, um, and if uh, the seeding schemes need to, to equalize rather than receiving schemes, um, that creates the whole merry-go-round. You know, we, we need to go, not only do we have to, to get the right equalised GMPs in, but we also have to supply the right equalised GMPs going out. So that will be fun. But again, I wouldn't necessarily start uh, giving up for that until we've heard the verdict. Right. Very good. Um, thanks for that. Oh, that sounds very echoey. Try that again. Um, the really audience are really putting their thinking caps on, firing in some really tough questions. Um, I think they're tough, maybe you won't, but um, will rectification payments use the LTA percentage? So would a new certificate need to be issued? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is a, a 
bit of a doozy. It's certainly not my expertise, and obviously we would see to, to get a fuller answer on that one. But yes, the LTA is affected, and um, you know, there's, there's talk about you know uh, unauthorized payments that could result from this. Um, the LTA obviously is a bigger concern because that has tax implications. Um, if that goes up, you know, the member is then impacted negatively on the tax and therefore the increase on what they got could be offset by the tax they now have to pay. Right, um, here's one. It looks as though we're going to have to track down members who have transferred out to provide any additional benefits for the GMP exercise. Do we know HMRC's view on secondary payments if the member has subsequently taken their benefits or transferred benefits again to another provider? Well, this is the, the, the whole merry-go-round, uh, as we mentioned before. Um, I think for me, that will be a nightmare. Um, for that simple fact, you know, members transferring to say the PPF or the FAS or, or schemes that have now uh, you know, gone bust and then gone into the PPF or scheme or members that have transferred and bounced, you know, gone to one scheme to another scheme. Um, I think we should wait for the verdict, see if there's any appeals on the verdict, um, and then hopefully, the, you know, the PASA, um, HMRC um, will start to, to give guidance on, on, on whatever comes out. Right. Um Will the latest Lloyd's case impact CETVs yet to be paid, which are paid before equalization, rather than just historic transfers? Yeah, I, I think, you know, when, when schemes started, uh, or when we had the verdict in, in October 18, um, a few schemes looked to change their transfer um, calculation so that they were actually equalizing at that point so they would not need to come back um, you know when we talk about equalization we in the main talk about pensions and how they're affected and, and positively or negatively affected and giving the positive to the member however you know back in 2018 there was a there are members that, that go from active to deferred deferred to pension or active to pension or transfer out Schemes at the time um, have looked at, you know, changing their transfer basis so that they need to be, you know, re-looked at. Um, I would have thought that if schemes took on board, you know, uh, one of the, the methods, one of the suitable methods, say C2, um, then they should be fine, you know, because they've already paid out an equalised benefit. Now, we, we've seen that most or some schemes are even now, you know, stopping any transfer ins coming in. You know, they're, they're, unless they're equalised. Um, I don't think the court case will, you know, will look at payments that have been made on an equalised basis from uh, October 18. Obviously, anything that's unequalised, of course it will. You know, um, I, I believe that the, the date in time is October 2018. Anything prior is through the court case, anything after will be natural equalisation. But again, you know, we were talking about just transfer values, you know, there could have been um, yeah, exercises like ill health or retirement, you know, they will need to be looked at. Um, they're probably some of the most urgent cases to, to ensure that they are equalised. We know that we have um, um, like pie exercises, you know, um, can't think of the term now. Um, whereby we, we we pay members in full um, lump sum. Why not lump, not wind up? I've lost it. Um, it's going to come back to me. If somebody please shout on the chat to tell me what I'm trying to think of here. Um, but yeah, the, the members that we've um, given one lump sum benefit to. Um, that's going to annoy me. Today. Um, but again, these exercises, you know, if they're not been done on an equalised um, method, will need to be looked at again. You know, anything prior to our oh, commutation, thank you. Thanks, Tina. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, on commutation, you know, for short um, or trivial commutations, you know, they will need to be looked at. There may be suggesting that we have to go back and look at trivial commutations in the past. I'd like to hope not, though. 
Very good. Well, that was our you want to be a millionaire, ask the audience moment. It did very well. Thanks to the audience. Um, is there a formula con converting a known male GMP into a female GMP, or is it back to basics using contracted out earnings on a year by year basis? Yeah, I, well, again, this is the, the formula. You know, there's always a clever formula that we can establish to go from one to the other. Uh, however, you know, it gets a little bit more tricky when it comes to um, what happens post members reaching age 60. Um, you know, earlier we said that uh, accrual stops at age 60 or the 5th April prior to 60 for a female, whereas it doesn't for a male. You know, I doubt that schemes would have recorded a contract out earning for a, for a female that, you know, left, you know, left early and, and didn't actually, oh, sorry, not left early, but, you know, um, hit GPA or GMP age at 16, you know, um, but retired at 62. No one was capturing what would have been the contract out earnings. Um, so it could be done by assumption, you know, ideal in first principles because that's always you know, the best way of calculating anything. Um, but again, you know, looking at the post-90 GMP, you know, the, the government have got the GMP checker in place. They does calculate GMPs on a, a post-90 basis, both true and opposite sex, but um, it needs to be fully understood the limitations of the calculations you are getting. Um, there's also the later earnings additions that needs to be um, looked at with certainly members that have gone past, um, you know, their GMP age. So again, that adds, a, you know, complexities. But again, talking to the advisors, talking to the admin, talking to actuaries and actually understanding what all of that means for the scheme itself, informed decisions can be made. Right, and back to the four methods, which seems to have captured lots of people's attention today. Um, you mentioned that insurers may provide may prefer method D when approaching a buyout. Um, for those who have decided on their approach, do you know just overall if there's any one favorite method? For for myself. Well, for trustees or for yourselves, or it was interesting because you know, you know, in our bubble, you know. Method D does feel the right thing to do, especially from an admin perspective. If we can uh, mitigate any issues or, or calculations, you know, by making pensions simpler, you, you are mitigating another uh, issue that could go wrong. Um, so I think Method D was always the approach that um, we felt. I know a few actors that we spoke to, again, you know, Method D is the way we all thought it would be. But we're hearing from independent trustees, you know, and trustees that actually C2 is more appropriate. Uh, and I think that's actually, you know, through us a little bit, you know, uh, you know, talking to some of our industry counterparts that I think it's, it's probably nearly 50-50, you know, is C2 appropriate, is D2. But I think it is pretty much those two that everyone is talking about. And it's, it is a choice between C2, D2. Right. Okay. And um, more on insurance companies, Tracy Deeks, because Tracy, of course, gave you the answer. Uh, so we'll answer the question. How much of an issue is equalization if you are considering doing a buyout with an insurance company? Well, again, you know, uh, schemes or buyout companies, insurers may not even entertain it unless it's been equalized. You know, we know uh, that for the past few years, equalized, oh, insurers have been asking for equalized GMPs. Um, so yeah, it could be a, a, a no starter again, but that's that's up to the insurance uh, company. The insurances will obviously uh, put in place a premium, a, a, you know, data premium, risk premium. Um, they may accept it, but the risk premium to accept it may be massive, you know, and the risk premium itself, the data premium, could be higher than actually doing this job and doing it in the first place, and then trying to buy it. Right. Okay. So here's a question. Somebody who's clearly looking at this and thinking about maybe they don't want to do it at all. Is there any view around the trustee being penalized or fined if they continue to take no action with regard to paying correct benefits in light of GMP reconciliation, rectification, and equalization? 
Yeah, well, there's no penalty as tees in place. And again, there's this, 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 this argument uh, around deadlines. You know, there's no deadline to do this. Um, I get the feeling that even though there is no deadline, there will be an expectation to do so. Um, I believe that the Ombudsman, if anything should go wrong, you know, if a member comes forward, believes that they're unfairly um, been dealt with, you know, through the, the pension payments that they may be missing, um, could actually take a course to the Ombudsman. The Ombudsman might not look very kindly if no activity has started or a blatant disregard to actually even bother. Uh, anyway, in these sort of decisions, an informed decision should be made. So uh, a do nothing approach, we, we certainly advocated, or not advocated, that's probably wrong on me to say, we certainly knew that in GMP reconciliation, one of the um, options open to trustees was a do nothing approach, but they should be looking at the extent of the issue before taking a, a, a a uh, do-nothing approach. Right, okay, for the last question, this one looks like as if it might have a yes or no answer. Um, if a member dies prior to equalization, is the equalization amount due to their estate? Again, this is a tricky one. Uh, the, <laughs> the simple answer is yes. You know, obviously the, 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 the court case came in play in October 18, so um, if we use that as the, the benchmark date, then yes, if a, if a member died, then the equalised benefits should be payable back to the estate. Uh, again, this gets really tricky, you know, is the estate there, is the estate disbanded, is, it, is there any um, payees? Again, that's up to each individual scheme, but I would say, yeah, probably, definitely, it should be paid. Very good. Well, thanks for that. It's all we have time for today. Um, a lot to take in. Um, I think it's very good news that the GMP Equalization Made Simple Guide is on its way to you in the next few days, because I think that making this all simple would be very, very welcome. Um, so please look for that in your email box. Um, Stuart, you've agreed to kindly answer, to, you've kindly agreed to answer some of the extra questions, so I'm going to send those along to you, and we'll be putting them up on our website and let everyone know when that's been done. And many thanks to Stuart and his colleagues at Equinity and mine at the PLSA who worked on today's webinar and the Made Simple Guide. And many, many thanks to all of you for joining today. Bye for now.